And ultimately these little histones form this really cool like bead-like structure and sort of stack on one another. And that is the thick filament that slowly but surely comprises a chromosome. So for a really long time, when we first saw histones, we assumed that their only role was storage because it is important. It's a lot of DNA. Remember I told you about bananas and how they have like four times the size of genome of us? Same thing. You gotta have a very efficient way to store things. That's the primary role of histones. Now the other, I'll ask a very simple question. To do transcription, do you need to have access to the DNA, right? We can all agree on that. If it is packed in cold storage, tightly up in histones, way deep in the chromosome and unaccessible, that gene is not on, is it? It is not possible to access that for polymerase, right? This is the second role of histones. They can decide which genes are available, like you see on the left, and which genes are silenced, packed away never to be transcribed. Let's actually start here before we do any details. Now, the cool thing with this is that, I mean, as far as histones go, DNA is only active if it's literally physically available in this case, right? We can't even start all the stuff we saw yesterday with transcription, all the little TFs, all the little enhancers, right? all that stuff, nothing's gonna happen if it's all packed away over here. It's just silence, it's off, can't get to it, that's it. So this is a very upfront, clean way to do this. Obviously there are details around this. One of the key things is that DNA itself, it's highly negatively charged, okay? Those gigantic phosphate groups that we saw before, they are negative. A histone itself is highly positively charged, like a little magnet to DNA. So on a typical histone, you are able to do like two loops of DNA that is very negatively charged. And that's gonna keep it fairly stored away in that case. One key thing to change this and to open things up is you destroy the positive charge of the histone. That's what this little acetylation chemical group does. All you need to know for this is that basically, if you add an acetyl group to this histone, you can just call it AC, you sort of minimize that positive charge. Suddenly what was like tightly wound about a histone Can now sort of open up because it's not, it's no longer being, see, sorry, it's getting a little messy. But the DNA that's negative is no longer being like bound up by that positivity of the histone. A little better way than me scratch drawing it. So, Genes are open for business if they are unbound by histones and literally physically available. To unbind them, you must remove that positive charge from those little spheres. So these all have had now like kind of net negative, like regular charge now. A little zero represents like nothing. And that's to thank because of these little acetyl groups. In this case, DNA is accessible. See all this region right here? Excellent. This is where you can actually have transcription and RNA show up. Now, if you do not modify this and you keep a nasty positive charge on all these histones, everything stays. Nothing gets in, nothing goes out. Negative charge binds to the positive and we're stuck. So there are two genes that can 
change this balance to types or families of genes. Some are histone acetyltransferases, or you can call them HATs. They will add the histones and they will open DNA up for business. They have an opposite member of that family that does the opposite role. HDAX, they will remove histones. They will silence DNA. They will remove uh, acetyls from the histones, sorry. You don't need to know any chemical structures or anything like that, but do know that these are ingredients of which matter in the silence versus non-silence sort of like decision, is a gene on or off? The presence of these genes, the drugging of these genes, you can change a lot of stuff. Now, if you're a chemistry type and it helps, the reason histones are so positive is an amino acid lysine, super positive. They're just rich with it. And if you can modify the positive lysine tail and get rid of that positive, suddenly it's not as attractive to DNA anymore. That's how the acetyl groups work. They're a small modification that changes that charge. And the blue text is basically that these things work in sort of a concert together, turning on sets of genes, turning off others, kind of working back and forth with each other's relationship. So very fun little example here, ants. I think this is in the, hopefully this is in the key info. If you send in a drug, just a little chemical that disables one of the acetylone transferases or the HDAX, one of those ups, downs, silencing signals, you can change the cast or the cased of an ant. Because every ant is born pretty similar genome, but they have wildly different phenotypes, right? Soldiers, workers, nurses, the whole thing. You can control that decision by changing which histones are modified and which are not, which ones are open for business, which ones are not. Now, when you do this, you are changing the trajectory of thousands of genes at once. And it is pretty impactful. But at birth, you can treat these things and it will change their trajectory. It's pretty, pretty fun time. Maybe we should do this, but I wouldn't, I'd feel kind of bad doing this to the fly. Not a fun time, I don't think. But we do have things that can modify this. We are just starting that process in medicine, I'd say. It's a very, it's a very small process because we're kind of playing with fire. So this also helps with a very important question that we haven't technically addressed yet. Lots of us in here have two X chromosomes. Lots of us in here have just one. As many differences as we do have, and we do, we're quite alike, right? We came out pretty similar. Arms, legs, brains, everything, like everything's normal. But that's a whole chromosome, thousands of genes of dosage and all kinds of stuff that you would expect to change the equation a little bit. Like I said, dosage matters quite a bit. In female mammals, in our case that we're talking about here, or any, any time that you're looking at the genetic sex that has the two versions of the chromosome, the, the copies and not the Y, not the Z or whatever, in 50% of your cells, one of the X's is active, and in 50% of your cells, the other X is active. You blanket silence a random X to make sure that technically each one of your cells has a dose of just one X. Now, as an organism, we've got trillions of cells. That's why you come out as sort of like you got the mix. You can have, you can utilize both of your X chromosomes, just not in the same single cell at the same time. So again, exemplified by Calico Cat. One of your worst enemies from exam one, one of the X's in them, the orange or the black in this case, will be shut down, silenced with histones. They wrap the DNA up never to come out. And the other gene is allowed to take over. And that's how you can become, that's how chimeric genetics work with X chromosomes. So it's sort of like incomplete dominance. Now, this sort of permanent pass down this happens through something called imprinting. Imprinting is uh, characteristically, 
I hope this slide does the right justice to it, but imprinting is not a genetic alteration, but it is that genes that were silenced in one parent will pass on silenced to the offspring. Certain genes that are passed on active with active histones, those marks will be passed on to the offspring. Now, as you can tell here, it can be random which allele your offspring get in that case, because remember, they're only getting just that one each time. The stamping signal that a long time ago we figured out, these genes are silenced, we don't really know why. That answer today is that it depends on the pattern of on and off and activation of the histones that you pass on. So in this case, both of these little IGF-2 mouse genes, little growth genes, they're both working genes, nothing wrong with their code. The code surrounding them that either attracts or dissuades acetylation of their histones to be active, that's the change. What this means is that there are lots of genes in your genome that can express given if given the right signal. What this means for medicine is that could we, instead of you know running around CRISPRing everything, couldn't we just change this pattern a little bit, right? Problem is it's hard to target. Most of these little HDACs and these things, they are doing thousands of genes at a time. So you kind of play with fire if you want your gene to turn on. You may turn on a hundred other bad ones. Okay. So fun. Ligers are real, by the way, those hybrids, that's a real thing. I saw one in Florida. It was the only good part of being in Florida. Sorry. <laughs> it was for kind of a little family reunion and I'm the oldest cousin by, a, by about a decade. And so you can imagine sitting at that kid's table is not fun for me. So take a look right here at a liger. This is a hybrid. Now, male lions, their growth genes, when they pass, they're never silenced. In fact, they're completely acetylated. And they're open for business. They want all their offspring to be huge and powerful and big. Male lions don't raise the kids, unfortunately. They don't really do any work on that sense. Female lions, on the other hand, they actually silence their growth genes into their offspring. Because female lions are going to have to raise their entire set. They have to do all the work. And if they're huge and muscle bound, you got to feed them more. So you kind of strike a balance here. Now, tigers don't have this problem. They just kind of both have a somewhat active growth gene. So in this hybrid set, the massively on male growth gene and the regular tiger one make a liger. You can't really tell from the picture up here, but this thing is about 1300 pounds. It's like a buffalo. It's huge. And it's just like really beefy and eats all day. It would never survive in the wild because it needs to eat like 60 pounds a day. Because that's a lot of growth gene to feed. So a liger can only come from a dad lion based on the silencing. A tigon is this ornery little like kind of small cat looking like hybrid. It's very different than the liger because it didn't get a growth gene from either parent, at least a very active one. So that silencing kind of plays in here. And it's interesting that patterns of silencing can have a much bigger effect than any coding differences between either species in this hybridization. So, fun stuff. Go ahead and take a break, it's a lot. Think and make sure you're right now, maybe don't take a break, but measure how you feel right now where you're at with histones. Silence, not silenced, what does that mean physically?
My bad. So the reason I sort of take a pause here is what we're entering is sort of the realm of genetics that we don't, we don't have as much control over as the others. All the things, all the legends, all the craziness that we know of inheritance comes from what we're about to see. And there will be times that I'll have to tell you it's too complicated for us to know that answer about certain things. Those questions won't be on the test, don't worry. But like I said, this region is the most powerful because you don't just pass on the code, you pass on down how it's read, what's silenced, what's not. And those patterns can change in a single generation and a single organism. What I want to get across here again, and I said this yesterday, nature and nurture are not two things. They are one and the same if you consider things this way. But if the environment acts on something, the genome is a reactive thing. It's not some static thing that evolves over time in the exact sense that we would typify it. Those of you with a zoo background or even a human background, this question is one that is very difficult to answer. What is a more powerful change? One that populations over time make permanently or just really good ways of using the recipe you have and changing each time you use it. Okay, let's get back technical. Basic idea here is that DNA has to get replicated, has to get on and off all the time, got to be responsive. That's why histones are such a key important part of this is that their little positive charge, being able to erase that suddenly and unleash DNA, that will make, that's what makes them so flexible. Now, you don't need to know the cool structures and et cetera specifically for this. That's if you take molecular reductor land. But look at how cool the rosette structures of DNA are, right? That's how it like winds up and like stacks into a chromosome. It's pretty cool. Main thing I need from this slide is just the fact that DNA is very reactive. Like we talked about last time, environment, stress, massive amounts of some sort of bodily signal can unlock DNA for you. This is what a histone looks like. It is made of eight segments, four genes that are quite related. As you can tell, they stack into sort of a sphere. Those of us with a fun biochem background, you can see on the lower right, that's what the actual protein looks like. The cyan blue is the DNA wrapping around it. These little structures are quite common throughout any eukaryotic cell. One thing I also want to note here, none of this is in bacteria, prokaryotes. The genome's just out. So these little subunits, they are, it seems simple. This is the beginning of what we call a histone code. What your histones at certain areas are made of? Are they made of stickier versions of these? Are they made of less sticky versions? How easy are they to modify to open up and down? As you can tell, nicely done here. They are perfectly made to just have some DNA loops around. So what I mean by the histone code, I talked about acetylation that AC. Let's find a good one. There it is. The pattern, what, what these histones have are little amino acid tails. That's what you're seeing here for H3, H2A, H4. And they have marks on them, marks that can be added by other chemicals to make DNA more or less attractive to be open or not. Sadly, I'm going to have to leave you here with this, that we don't know that pattern completely. We have no idea the exact specifications we would need to target to, let's say, open up a single gene, right? Sadly, all we can do right now with this is just in mass, make a bunch of changes and we can see them. But the stickler, for example, H3 
K27, K being the notation for lysine. This is a really consistent mark, for example, of open for business genes. So if you acetylate this positive lysine and you destroy that positive charge, suddenly the DNA unwinds quite a bit from this loop. Suddenly it's accessible. There's a few other marks um, in this case that we are fairly confident on. It's a very tough road ahead as far as what it takes to understand this. Equally, here's some methylation groups. I know 17 is a big one for activation. This is a key difference between methylation. If you methylate DNA, it is silenced. If you methylate a histone tail, which is a protein, sometimes that can be silenced, sometimes it can be activated. Sorry, ambiguousness is not everybody's thing. I get that. These little marks and deciding who's open for business and what, that is our best look inside how we can access that DNA. And these marks change physiologically as you react and as the environment has an impact on you. So the key is that we can negate these usual positive amino acids with acetylation. They ungrab the DNA, DNA is open. It's the basic side of this. That's the side that I'd expect, like at least know that part. Okay, <laughs> even more complex. Uh, even if we're looking at one histone, unfortunately, they all interact together in weird, strange, crazy chemical patterns to decide who's on and off. So even at our best look at a single histone, we can't technically account for the family around it. And that makes things complicated. That's why this is blue text. It's just kind of supposed to show, hey, this is tough. So how does this impact things? Starvation is an event an environmental event that can trigger semi-permanent imprinting changes of who's on and who's off. So close out of World War II, the Netherlands is somewhat still surrounded by Nazi Germany. They have very little access to their ports, food slows down. Although the allies are advancing, winter sets in, I believe 1944, everyone starves. It's called the hunger winter in, in Dutch. As you can tell, things got really dicey. Long periods of starvation, not acute, but very long, an entire winter of feeling this way. The body reacts to survive. It turns on genes, turns off others to get to a closer phenotype that no matter how little energy you consumed, you can still survive. It turns off a lot of non-essential systems in your body. It doesn't let any inner energy go to waste. Now, strangely, children that survived that winter had their own children. And uncharacteristically, they were very prone to obes obesity. People didn't really understand why. They're like, it must be the environment. They must love food after going through that, right? Not quite. When we would later check these genomes and see we would see that the histones and the areas around genes responsible for energy storage were completely acetylated. Everything was on. Any energy that went into those poor kids was stored forever because their parents had been through something that their bodies reacted and their genomes reacted and said, never don't store energy again or you will die. And that's the key with stories like this is that None of those kids had mutations. None of them had different alleles, SNPs, anything. It was all a question of when survival mattered, their genome was imprinted on. Those patterns were given to children because in, in evolution and in animals, if you undergo something that long-term, you will try and at least pass those marks on, those silence marks. Starvation's one example, but I do want you to think of the others, right? I mean, all kinds of events that could happen that can be passed on. That quote that I gave you, sins of the fathers, et cetera, right? It's possible. Okay. So 
take another sort of recap for a minute or two. Write the things you feel good about, write the things you don't. I'm not gonna have you turn them in, it's just helpful sometimes. Like I said, this stuff is in the realm of, um, it's pretty detailed. Good question kind of lead in is how does this imprinting actually physically occur? It's the actual responsible party for this. So taking back to these tails and the marks that we know about them a little bit. Some of these marks don't work quite like the positive charge ones that just release the DNA. Others serve as sort of docking sites for very specific genes that will decide who to turn on and who to turn off. Now you don't need to know each of these names here, nor do you really need to know the specific marks or what they attract. What I do need you to know is that these signals and these chemical modifications are the key towards saying this gene is now extremely on. It is now extremely attractive to a transcription factor because you added this mark right here. Children of the hunger winter added a lot of marks to open a lot of genes for business about energy storage. Those marks can be passed on, or at least the pattern of adding them. So for example, on histone three, lysine nine. If you add these two little methyl groups or a triple methyl group, you attract a signal over here, KDM genes, that will actually repress and sort of de-emphasize that set right there. Other than of them on the top will be more attractive to those transcription factors and those initiators of let's make this gene. So key things that you can take from this is that marks, specific marks on those histone tails can deliver us amounts of genes. And that these marks can happen after the environment says to do it. It doesn't have to evolve over time, quote unquote. So kind of cool thing, like I said, we are getting better at sort of mastering these little marks and saying this gene that's coming over here that's very attractive for genes, let's shut that down. Let's see what happens after that. This is our best move at basically surgically applying what genes are on and off. Unfortunately, it, like I said, it's playing with fire because when you kill off, let's say one of these that maybe is causing cancer or disease, you may kill off a bunch like hundreds of genes it was turning on elsewhere in the histone set that now are off and now they're causing their own issues. So we're very bad at like pinpointing which genes to turn on and off. Now, if we get better at that though, that'd be, that'd be kind, of, kind of cool. So this is just blue text because you don't need to know it, but it's helpful. Um, different transcription factors have different active sites for what they're looking for. What does their docking site look best as, et cetera. Equally. There are things that will 
just scoot histones out of the way to make room for DNA. I like this one because it's pretty easy. If you want that DNA right here, for example, well, you can just delete the histone that was there. You can move it. Sometimes you can add a little variant. Some variants are less sticky than others of those little, those little uh, spheres. So that can help sometimes. There's all kinds of ways that you can sort of open things up and start making a gene. This is just a closer look at that. There are genes that are called, they're big like motherships that remattle chromatin. So anytime you see chromatin, it's just DNA. It's just a fancy way of saying it. And all you got to do in a lot of cases is just get that exposed promoter out, promoters there. RNA polymerase, everything starts happening and we're good to go. So as long as you can position the histones to get that promoter out, you're in a pretty good spot. Now, on any sort of test style question and I say something rude like, you have all the stuff, you have activators, enhancers ready to go, you got transcription factors, the repressor's dead, but you never got rid of the histones. Even with all the other army of good things to make that gene happen, you gotta literally have the gene open. And that's, that's stuff like this that can be very reactive. Okay, so another one, epigenetic inheritance. So the patterns of who's open for business can change in parents and be passed down to children like we saw with the mouse fear smell, those fear, genes that would inspire fear to that smell were very active in those parent mouse. Similarly, we can do something pretty, pretty unique. Hey, you know what? This is probably a better experiment for the poor mouse than some stuff I've seen happen to him. So, hey. So, progressive amounts of cocaine in the water. Dad and mom mouse, more cocaine. Done, done, more, 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 more. And eventually they get to be resistant to it because their heart doesn't just respond anymore. Their heart's just kind of permanently like going all the time now. Now, you know, kind of semi-hilarious as this is, all their offspring were born. And then when they're exposed to cocaine, there's no effect. They were born with the genes to survive with tons of cocaine in their water. Interesting. So this brings into account with like, you know, I know I'm a human person, but like, this is a very good example with plants too, how mom and dad or clone of offspring plants can pass quite a bit of survivability down to their offspring without ever actually changing their genome. It's just all a question of how you use it in this case. Again, we've already seen this word, that's imprinting. Poor mice. Okay, so last little pause here. We have one little set, how imprinting works and why it stays. That's coming up next. And that's the only, that's the last bit. Yeah. So why can these patterns be sustained? Because you, you'd have to imagine, otherwise you'd have to put in a lot of machinery to on and off, on and off, on and off, right? Wow. 
once you open DNA and you do expose a promoter, this gene called a bromodomain that comes in. And what these do is actually kind of permanently stretch out the open section and they keep it on throughout meiosis, throughout offspring, the whole thing, every cell. The marks that we talked about in that second section before, they are very attractive to these. What you're looking at is permanent imprinting, semi-permanent, eventually, maybe it goes away. But if an organism encounters so much environmental stimuli that they need to keep those genes open for business, a bromo domain can come in and basically just keep these things open, stuck open. And that's how permanent imprinting works. It's the same case in the tiger gene. It's the same case in the smell gene with the rats and the fear. It's the same gene, gene, case with all the cocaine stuff with the poor mice. But that's how you make a once transient reaction of your genome basically part of you. It can take several generations for these to fade. The opposite of this is if you want to close a gene permanently, there's something called a chromodomain. Sorry, this is good notebook. This is good note material for the test. They find regions that are closed and the body has told them repeatedly stay closed. They will come in and basically crunch that together and they will lock it in. They will not let it out. Think of it sort of as a, maybe like a prison basically for that DNA. This is what happened to a lot of the genes in this stabilized closed state of children of those who lived through that Dutch winter. They closed up business for a lot of genes that typically would lose energy and not store it. That was semi-permanent. Okay. So this is just a closer look at what we just saw. It's nothing, nothing new. Basically, bromo domains kind of hook into histones and just latch on. Same with chromodomains, they keep them closed, keep them open chemically. That is their active site, quote unquote, is a histone that they have been directed to attack. The marks on the tails of those histones are a big factor in what is attractive for bromo or chromodomain. So if your head's spinning a little bit, don't worry, so is every scientist out there. We're still trying to all, no, sorry, I'm not gonna count myself if I was a real scientist. <laughs> They all are doing a very good job of trying to see these patterns and what emerges in disease, in all kinds of stuff. Now, importantly, they, you don't need to know the details here other than the histone marks, they will pass down during replication. Cause like I said, you gotta have the same marks, right? Just like you gotta have the same DNA. So there are mechanisms to mark which ones are closed for business and which ones are open in the next generation next generation of offspring, next generation even of just a cell. So during DNA replication, the histones are also undergoing their own little parental parental markings so that they stay kind of, everything stays in track. So those are the details behind why a gene can either be completely off or completely on and that can pass through generations, what triggers it, and why this sort of magic behind inheritance exists. So you can just kind of think to yourself, just for like, I don't know, 30 seconds or so, what are other things that are clearly not genetic that we've talked about, but have somewhat of a role of being inherited? So obviously we covered a lot of fun examples. Kind of at least think to yourself. because your examples of this are always gonna be that much more powerful than mine, because they're yours. So one unique and very exciting version of this is domestication. Those animals are very, you know, hardline coding genetics very similar to their ancestors, but they behave pretty differently. 
dogs mostly included, right? And if we're talking behavior and neuroscience type stuff, it gets complicated, but it does follow the same rules. When I taught that domestication class at um, previously, it's kind of, it was like a little short, like sort of FIAC style class. I came across some stuff that was always really tough to see. You get into livestock stuff, you know, you see some stuff you wish you hadn't saw. I want to ask everybody though, have you ever gone up to, would you feel too bad if you went to one of the cornfields out around campus and you took a kernel of corn and you cracked it in half or you split the kernels off of it, right? And then you just threw it away. Not too bad, right? Corn didn't necessarily undergo too much with that, right? Livestock, they have quite a bit of animal welfare laws behind them, surprisingly, even to, most, to some of us. Would you consider the, well, sorry, there's a, there's a key distinction between livestock and crops, though. It's kind of what I'm saying. There's a very unique phenotype that exists epigenetically. It's not domestication. It's not livestock. Ur animals are considered crops. There are no laws to protect their treatment. Nothing. Very little. Caged phenotype is a sort of offshoot of domesticated. But instead of living sort of in a calm state, they live in a hellish, born to die stress state forever. All the marks that we talked about today, they are on in every one of these generations forever because their parents were born in this and so will they be. The survival on and offs come with prices. Tumors, fighting, aggression, eating your own offspring, suffering, if you want to call it that, I don't know. I'm a big animal person, so when I came up against this in the class, it was hard to cover. Because genetically, they are quite different, just not in the code, from the mink, foxes, everything that they came from. But they exist as very, very different creatures. It's very difficult to, quote unquote, uncage one of these. And what I mean by that is, if you do rescue one of these, like save a fox in Lakeville, of all places. It's the biggest fox uh, rescue in the, in the whole country, if you ever guys want to ever visit it. It's very hard for them to come back from this because their genome is wired to be in survival mode forever, to survive this hell as long as they can. It's a very unique but troubling example of how this works. So, not to be too grim, I know. It's kind of my thing is, I don't really like that side of, and Minnesota's a pretty big fur place, so kind of my thing that I want to figure out a way to not have that be as big of a deal. So looking at everything we've seen, though, we have a lot more tools than we started this class with, or even after we ex ended exam one with, right? The genome acts not in a permanent mutation way all the time. A lot of the time, you are changing it. You have control over what's active. The environment does have a bit of control over you as well. Physiologically, even though humans are quite plastic, which means we can think our way out of quite a bit, we can also think our way into quite a bit of other bad stuff, right? The variants that we all talked about, a lot of them we're talking about, well, you know, I have anxiety, depression, I have OCD, I, you know, I have this, that. I'm not devaluing that. I'm just saying those genes existed generations a long time ago. For whatever reason, though, maybe it's more diagnoses. But they are sort of coming up to the surface, right? You'd agree. So this is red, but I do. It is meant to be a summary for you. You don't have to know all these pieces. So I always like to ask this question. And for those of the psych majors in this room, fun times. This is an evil scale. Best guess. If you're a zero, you're not evil. Good job. If you're a one, you uh, killed in self-defense or something. Now, for all of you true crime, uh, true crime people, yeah, you'll start to see like, oh, oh boy. Yeah, we get into some dark stuff. Is this scale determinable? And is somebody that acts on this What if they had a couple of factors not in their playing field? What have we talked about before? So 
This guy's name's Carl Panzram. He's a really evil, awful dude. He's from Red Wing, Minnesota, back in like 1903. So you got all the factors that you need in Carl. You have a Y chromosome. You have an abusive, neglectful upbringing. Very importantly, and those that you have ever played sports, et cetera, the conversation about concussions is a lot more, uh, a lot more pre pre uh, prevalent lately. Oops, too many. Trauma repeatedly is a big, big association with tendencies like these to want to commit as much as possible. One of his other quotes is that things were done to me as a kid when he had to run away and live life on the trains. Things were done to me that convinced me that every human on the planet should die. you are missing pieces that can dissuade you from firing into that sort of way, right? Are you not predisposed to being, is this person predisposed to being like that? Like we talked about, as complex as the human brain is, there is pieces of, there are pieces of inheritance that matter. Now, in the wrong hands, this is what would start happening in the violence craze of the 80s. Some people are just born bad. Deviancy is evil, it's genetic. You gotta pre-isolate these people first before they commit a crime. See how quickly this can go downhill for everybody? Especially when you don't actually sequence everybody yet, but you can just assign and say, science, genetics, let's do this. That's the power that a class like this can hopefully give you is to understand the underbelly of stuff like this and show how this can't work. This doesn't work. This isn't how it goes. Even if there are elements to human psychology that are genetic. So back to this example. Think what it is like mono amylase oxidase anhydrase or something. All it's going to do is it is a neurotransmitter degrader. Neurotransmitters rise up naturally, and most of us, they go down pretty quickly. If you have a mutant version of this gene, like we've talked about, small studies show that then these neurotransmitters will stay on. It's hard to come down from either way that you feel. It's hard to find that way back. That's the study, at least. So... Some of you accessed the uh, article that I posted on D2L. Now is a good time to find that now, if you have not. So either, at least on your phone. Knowing what you know about coding DNA, epigenetics, nature nurture and that question, I want you to read through that right now. It's less than a page, don't worry. What the authors are after is something I'm after as well. How much do genomics belong in a courtroom? Should just be in our most recent week.
So I want you to note how well the authors navigate the fact that this gene is only very lightly studied. Okay. I can attest that there are mouse experiments that the principle holds in extreme experimental scenarios. Mice aren't human though. Right, so who's gotten to at least the part where he does it? Yeah, we're about, we're about there. So, dude with a history of abuse, chronic drifter throughout his life, walks into a church in Arkansas has some sort of altercation with an older 84-year-old woman. He takes a cross and beats her to death. Admits to it quickly after he was picked up, less a few hours after. He's just like, yeah, I did it. I don't know. Doesn't really talk about his remorse or anything. This isn't a psych class. It's mainly about how his defense came up. And remember, being an attorney is tough. You may know your client did this objectively evil thing. But your job technically is to find ways to defend them, okay? Especially when you're a public defender. Does a deficiency in this gene, does a predisposition towards violent act in a court, does that count sort of as a mens rea thing? Now, mens rea in Latin, like, I, like it says in the article, a guilty mind, was their intent, was their guilt, their actual is there actual evil, quote unquote? You can't get into morality in a courtroom, though. So, easy enough. Let's just take the first stage of this. Reaction number one, we'll have a few. And if it ain't gonna work, just write it on your, write it on your little card, it's number one. Now, we're using this case as a, oops, wait, I gotta activate it, my bad. There you go, real good. So, this case is an example, but I'm asking you about the principle of it. Should we find a gene and confirm to our best knowledge that this predisposes individuals to be impulsive, to be tough, or sorry, not to be tough to calm down. Now remember, you can address this from a genetic or a, you know, from kind of from a multidisciplinary perspective here. Do we know that there are determinants of behavior? Yes, they do exist. Do those come down to a single gene? Some genes are more powerful than others, sure. So do imagine the audiences too that would be in this sort of courtroom, this writing, this whatever you're doing. You'd have the lady's family there, number one. And they'd be pissed, okay? More than that. They wouldn't like to see that, hey, that's not fair. This part, everybody's born different, right? Doesn't matter that this guy did this because he, or it doesn't matter, shouldn't matter to his sentencing. He should get the big one. So that is your initial just, 
hey, I'm a juror and I heard about this or I read about this. This is your initial reaction to that, this first part. The next thing, I want you to write this on the, on the page. What are the one to two strongest reasons that genetics should be considered and leniency can be granted here? So even if you don't feel that way, get ahead of your competition. What will they say? Equally, when we're doing this example, remember, um, control your feelings about the death penalty here. We're just using this as an example. Don't let that influence what the question is, which is, is does genetics belong in this stage? So when you're thinking of pieces that go towards the leniency, go towards that well, Mens rea is different for everybody. Think of examples, think of genes, think of things, stories we've told. That's where you can build this. This is where writing can make you very powerful. Where finding examples that speak to people make you very powerful. And I am essentially asking you for everything that we've learned to be sort of on the table here. What did we just learn about? How environment acts on people, right? In this story, we have somebody, child abuse, murder in their family, stress throughout their life. The same arguments are typically made in an insanity trial, but that's not technically what's happening here. Next, give me one to two reasons why, no, this isn't gonna work. We don't, we don't bring in genetic predispositions. Here's one, two reasons why. And I'm not talking moral stuff. I'm not talking anything like that. I mean, genetic stuff. I mean, why is this predisposition not gonna count with the individual? Why are we gonna go for the max in this case? So that would be point three on your little paper, I'd say. So what we're doing right now is worth a collective three points. So don't force me to be like, don't write something so general that it's just worthless, okay? This is part of these points. This is not one of those revision ones. This is something where I want to see your pieces of class that you feel strongly about, that you can cite and bring to the fold. Think about what either side has not considered about their strong points genetically. What weaknesses exist for both? Those are the proponents for the other side. Remember as well, in any persuasive or argumentative style of writing, you do not need to wholesale defeat the other side. 
a very quick and powerful tool is that you only need to complicate their side, okay? You only need to make it unattractive to think about for somebody else reading that side. Complication is a far easier way. Don't be afraid to play a numbers game here, too. There are other people with an MOA gene, right? Did they bludgeon an 80-year-old? How would this precedent affect, for example, any defendant with a Y chromosome, given what we know? about that set of genes. Okay, so you can add some details in a sec. Who finds it, at least on the genetic side, easier to argue the defense that dispositions should be considered in this case? Now, I don't, doesn't mean how you voted on there. Who finds that actually pretty easy to argue that like, hey, like genetics play a role in stuff, right? It's okay, yeah. Find somebody, each of you, could be the person next to you, could not, that has a different view on it. See how you came to those different ideas. See why and share why they felt that way too. So you may have to walk around the room a little bit if you agree with the person next to you. That's boring.
All right, last little stretch and we'll even get to end early. Last little clue. Um, yeah. So hopefully speaking a little bit, showed you a couple ways that you can see this, maybe a little differently. You don't have to agree either, but this is very much a gray area. And it's so rare in biology, you get to see that even though this, this is very much an evolving idea. And it's very hard for me to do a multiple choice on this. That's why there's points here today. Now, those of us that couldn't join today, they can come find me in office hours and let's do it that way, right? We did talk about being a little more flexible on that. They can find me, I'll play devil's advocate, fun times. It will be like a thesis defense, much more intense. All right, last little skill that I want you to try and master with what you already have written down. This is always a, this is always a tough assignment. We will do something more strict about this later, but what I want you to do next is you can choose either side to this. I want you to make a line that you can spin to jurors that don't have training in biology and make them believe one way or the other. I want you to use myth, mistruth. I want you to see how easy that is, okay? So that you can detect it when it really happens. This is always a dangerous, weird little assignment, right? It's awkward what I'm asking you to do. I want you to leave out details in this final little number four right here. I want you to take one of the sides of the others and completely erase the other. You don't have to lie. You just maybe bring up the right pieces to your story and forget the pieces of theirs, right? The reason is this, I don't wanna make liars out of you, but I want you to see how much responsibility comes with knowing how this works and being in a position to take the story that we saw in that article and spin it one way or the other in this gray area. And this time I want you to think that you're speaking to the jurors, not really me or yourself. It's a very strange genre that I'm asking of you. Like I said, the reason is I want you to know what that looks like that style of how to use half the information to get, pretend that you are giving the full picture with only a piece of the info. And equally, this is also an exercise in making sure that you're not, um, sometimes I'll try and guide you with like, here, think about this point, think about this point. Don't parrot the people that are teaching you, try and go beyond that. There's a guy at Mayo that taught surgery. One of the main things that he shows up with his residents, they all, he, he says he could bet 50 bucks, the sky's in blue and they're all just terrified. But by the end of his training, they're like, they're ready to like critique, say their own thing, say how they would adjust the procedure that level can begin today. You don't have to agree or, you know, remember, I'm not endorsing anything. I want it to come from you. Equally, don't neglect the fact that it's very hard to, in a controlled setting, to study behavioral genetics, right? It does complicate things. 